here at Calvary Chapel Cornerstone. And before Pastor Joe leads us in a in the Word of God, let's open with a word of prayer and a time of worship. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much, God, for your love, your grace, God, your mercy that you just pour out on us, Lord. And God, tonight I pray, Lord, that we would eliminate all distractions, Lord God, that we would come before you, Lord, and that we would give you our full attention, God, no matter what's going on around us, Lord. Father, may we take that time, Lord, tonight to prepare our hearts for your word, God. May we shut off any, any phones or, God, whatever we need to do, Lord, to, to prevent any distraction tonight, God, that we would seek you tonight, Lord, in all your glory. We love you, Father. We ask you to bless this time, Lord. Bless your people, God. Answer their prayers, Lord. Be all that they need you to be tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Just sing another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started And open up my heart to you Cause I'm caught up in your presence And 
And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment And I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you just want you and I'm sorry when I just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sing another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to I'm sorry when I come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment And I never want to leave And I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me More than anything that you can do, I just want you. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. And I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment And I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you and Lord Jesus we pray tonight God that that would be our desire God that we would just want you Lord that God that we wouldn't seek Lord what we can gain from you God but Lord we just want you Father, bless your people in the time of the word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have your Bible, grab it and open up to Esther's. Pastor Joe will lead us through the word. All right, good evening, church. As always, glad to be with you and want to welcome you this evening to our midweek study and those who may be watching online. And uh, we're glad to be with you as always. Just a couple announcements uh, for, for Easter and Good Friday. Uh, this Friday uh, at 6 p.m. we will have a video presentation of the Messiah in the Passover and it will be presented by Michael Cohen 
uh, from Chosen Ministries. A really neat time uh, to watch and just to see, uh, again, the Messiah and the Passover. Also on Easter Sunday at 10 a.m., uh, I'll be giving a Easter message uh, entitled Many Infallible Truths. So again, we welcome you to watch and uh, we do pray that God would uh, do a great work um, this Easter weekend. Let's open in prayer. Father, we come before you in Jesus name. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your many mercies, your grace, God, that is abundant. We thank you, Father, for your hand upon our lives and we do pray for our, our nation, God. We pray for um, those who are sick. We pray for those who, Father, are just um, struggling with this difficult time that, Father, we're living in. But, Lord, may we always remember that you said there would be these times, that there would be tribulation. But, again, to be of good cheer because you have overcome the world, God. And there's nothing we can't overcome when we look to you, God, and we turn to your word. And Father, we seek you. So, Lord, bless our time this evening. We thank you for the book of Esther. And we pray now that you would bless our time in chapter 4. And Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, open your Bibles to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. And the message tonight is entitled, It Only Takes One. It only takes one. All of man's problems are found in Adam. And all of man's solutions are found in Jesus Christ. Paul said in Romans 12, 5 through 15, Just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, for by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. All it took was one man's sin to bring the world to the place it is in right now. And you can see the mess that it is in right now. But here's the good news. All it's going to take is one man to make it what it once was. And here's the lesson. Again, it doesn't take a multitude to make a huge, lasting impression. We've been led to believe that it takes a village, or a group, or a committee, or a government to change things, when all it takes sometimes is just one committed individual. The Bible is full of stories about individuals who made a difference. For example, we have Abraham, Moses, David, Paul, Jesus, and tonight in our book, Esther. But it was God's hand that was on each one of these individuals that made the difference. They were individuals who thought and said and did what was right. King Ahasuerus' degree has gone out now that the Jews would be killed on March 7th of the next year. The city fell into uncertainty and to confusion. You know, they want to know what's going on. How did this all come about? What, what can we do about this? You know, what's going to happen? The plan to massacre all of the Jews had become law, and it was a done deal. And I'm sure the people started to freak out and to lose hope, to lay in bed every night knowing that that the day is going to come when we're all going to be murdered. But in the middle of all of this confusion and hopelessness, there's God sitting on the throne, and that is quite comfortably. In Ephesians 1.11, Paul said, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. And he's saying, nobody is going to do anything without my approval, without my involvement. He's got it all worked out. From the foundation of the world, he had written all of his plans for man and the world for one person to make a difference. So let's now look at verses 1 through 3 of Esther chapter 4. And it says, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth and ashes and he went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. The people are troubled. They're in deep mourning. What was the deal with the sackcloth and Mordecai? 
Well, sackcloth was made out of black goat's hair, and it was very coarse. It was bristly, and it was used for sacks. But people would wear it in times of mourning. Then they take ashes from a from a fire and throw them on themselves so that they look so that they'd be covered w- with the ashes, looking terrible and unclean. Now there was possibly about fifteen million Jews in the kingdom, and it would have been a terrible slaughter, so wrong and so uncalled for. But because one official, that is Mordecai, wouldn't bow down to Haman, an entire race was going to be wiped out. Mordecai may have gone to the city gates hoping to get Esther's attention, but that was as far as he could go. Because you see, uh, Oriental kings didn't live in a a, a world of reality. In other words, life for them was supposed to be beautiful, no problems, absent from the realities of life. According to the Scottish Scottish preacher, George H. Morrison, he said, no sackcloth must come within within their gates. So Mordecai was possibly trying to get Esther's attention at the city, but she was pretty much kept up, kept locked up at the very uh, and very protected uh, in King's harem uh, away from uh, the king and away from the affairs and the concerns of the common people. Now, the Jews believed in the decree that was written. It was the law of the Medes and the Persians, and it couldn't be changed. Clearly absent today is the conviction of men's hearts when it comes to the things of God, and especially when it comes to sin. Not only in the hearts of those who aren't saved, but also in the hearts and lives of believers as well. And I think most believers would tell you, yes, I trust in Christ but they don't have any real conviction of sin in their life at all. It's lacking in the life of the church today. When was the last time you heard a sinner, saved or lost, cry out for God's mercy? There's a lack of weeping over sin in the, in the lives of people today. Why is that? Because they just, just don't believe that God means what he says. They don't believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And they don't believe that God is going to bring judgment against sin one day. And the sinner who won't give it up. That is their sin. And who won't turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. Now Mordecai knew and believed how serious this decree was. So much so that he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth with ashes. He went out into the center of the city, and he cried out loud with a loud and bitter cry. Jews all over the kingdom mourned, and they fasted, and they wept, and they cried out. And they all believed the seriousness of the decree and what was going to take place. Verse 4, it says, So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she, then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. So Esther was told that Mordecai w- was acting kind of strange. He was wearing sackcloth and ashes, and he was mourning at the king's gate. Now, she wasn't told why he was behaving this way. So she did what, she, what, what came naturally. She sent him some clothes to put on so that his sackcloth outfit wouldn't cause the king's officers and guards to wonder why is he doing this what what's what's going on with this guy Mordecai what if the king should come out to the gate to be seen by the public by all the people Mordecai would have then been in real trouble the queen's motive were fine but before sending the clothes to Mordecai she should have tried to find out what was going on why was Mordecai behaving this way You see, if Ahasuerus did make a public appearance at the gate, Mordecai's palace garments might save him temporarily from the wrath of the king. But they couldn't rescue the Jews from the massacre that Haman had ordered for them. But Mordecai's mourning finally got the queen's attention, and that's just what he wanted. He wanted to get Esther's attention so that she would know or could know what was going to happen. Now, how does this apply to us this evening? Well, what a man wears won't change the fact that he's a guilty sinner before God. Neither will religion change the fact that the wages of sin is death and that God is going to judge one day. 
Remember when Uzziah became prideful and thought he could go into the temple and perform priestly duties? Well, he learned very quickly how wrong he was when God judged him right on the spot, striking him with leprosy. Just because Uzziah was wearing a priestly robe and had a censer in his hand, it didn't make him a priest. And people deal with sin in so many different ways. Some try the new clothes approach. That is, they refuse to believe that man is a sinner. And they'll put on any garment. That is, they'll do anything outwardly that might hide from them the reality of sin. Others put on the new clothes of improvement. They say that sin, you know, that sin is just a little weakness in my character, but it's only normal. Nobody's perfect. And I've heard many say that, well, this, this is the way God has made me. Why would he punish me for that? So they try to cover it with that, with that thought that, that that's the way God made me. They think that sin can be reformed. Now, Adam and Eve were the first ones to try this, this new clothes things. It says in Genesis 3, 7, you know, after they had sinned, that they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves coverings. But Genesis 3, 21 says, God made tunics of skin and he clothed them. So if we're not clothed in the righteousness of Christ, we're still in our sin. We're still in our shame and we'll be judged. Someone has said that today's pulpit has become a place where a mild-mannered man gets up in front of a group of mild-mannered people and urges them to be more mild-mannered. God said, you be holy because I am holy. So it's no surprise that the world today just walks past the church Sunday after Sunday, even though the doors are wide open. You see, there's nothing to draw them in. We don't need improving. We need to be totally changed in the image of Christ. We need to be born again because we have a sinful nature. And that sinful nature is not going to get any, anywhere near heaven on its own. You have to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you have to trust him by faith. He died on the cross for you. He took your place and my place and he's already paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. All you have to do is accept what he has done for you. It's not about what you can do for yourself. It's what he has already done for you. And if you go to heaven, it will be because you trusted him. You trusted the one who died for you, not because you made some new changes in your life. You see, you need a new garment, but you need to put on Christ. You need to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, his holiness. That is the only way, that is the only thing that will enable you to stand before God on that day. And if your faith does not drastically change your behavior, it's not going to change your destiny. Now, Mordecai, he wasn't about to accept any new clothes from the queen. And when the, when the clothes came back, you know, to her, She knew that there was something going on. There was something serious that was happening. She knew that it wasn't some minor thing that caused Mordecai to send the clothes back. Look at verses 5 and 6. Then Esther called Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he appointed to attend her. And she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. So Esther wants to know what's going on. Why has Mordecai, why, why has Mordecai put on this sackcloth in the ashes? Now, being queen, she couldn't go to him herself. She couldn't ask him what was going on. So what does she do? She sends this messenger, verses 7 and 8. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain to her and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for the for her people. So Mordecai doesn't tell her what's going on through the uh, 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 tell her what's going on uh, through the servant Hatchich, like the exact amount of money th- uh, that, that for those who are to carry out the plan. But he also sends official reliable proof. He sends a copy of the decree. He tells the servant, look, 
tell the queen to read this. It was signed with the king's signet ring. And, and, and notice how Mordecai didn't let his emotions take over. He didn't exaggerate. He was calm. He was collected. And he was very careful with the information that he gave Hatchich to give to Esther. This is an important lesson to learn and to understand. Are we careful when we tell other people things? Do we have all of the facts? Are the facts reliable? Do you have the proof that, that you need about what you're saying? Because see, a lot of people, they can, they can hurt or destroy many people or, or, or situations by half-truth, by gossip, by rumors. Information can be a matter of life or death. Mordecai has asked the queen here, and he says, go into the king and beg him to spare the people's lives. First of all, Esther has no idea if she'll even get to the king, much less be able to talk to him. Can you imagine if she gets to the king and she gets to talk to him? What would happen if the information that she gave him wasn't true and it wasn't complete? Mordecai knows that it could be lights out for the queen. You see, there's no room for mistakes. Lives are, de lives are depending on the right information. Verses 9 through 12. So Hathich returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther, Esther spoke to Hathich and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the, the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself, Esther says, yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. If Esther does what Mordecai says, that is, go into the king and tell him what's going on, that he might spare the lives of her people. If she does this, she risks losing everything, even her life. And even though she was the king's wife, she couldn't just drop by the office whenever she felt like it. That's just the way it was in those days in old Persia. The king had to send for her. The king had to okay her to come before him. She had to have his permission to come into, the, into, the, into where he was. And at that time, she says, he hasn't sent for me for 30 days. So if she decided to just go in to see the king without being called, he could have her killed on the spot. She was also a Jew. So who knows how he would react when he found out to that. So you see, this was a big deal. Mordecai knew Esther, and he knew her character, and he knew how far she would go with this. And this was the time to do it. So when Hathich comes back with Esther's answer, Mordecai, you know, with his shoulders back and his chest out and his chin up, he tells her like it is, verse 13 and 14. Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Again, Mordecai now lays it all on the line. He makes it clear to Esther. He says, Esther, don't think for a moment that because you live in the palace and you are the queen that you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. And we'll see later on that the king didn't know that she was a Jew. Mordecai went on to say that if you don't say anything, God's going to deliver us some other way. God isn't limited to you or to me in accomplishing his will. Deliverance would come from somewhere else, another place. Now, where does our deliverance come from? Only God. The psalmist said in, in Psalm 121, 1 and 2, he says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He says, my mind will be stayed on God as a God of power and a God who is all sufficient for us. He's more than enough. The psalmist did so. 
and found out that it was true. You see, we must not rely on men or men's ways. Does my help come from the hills, the psalmist said? He said, shall I depend upon earthly powers like, you know, princes and in men? It's useless to expect deliverance from hills and mountains. That is the things that God created rather than depending upon and trusting in the creator. Jeremiah 3.23, it says, Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. In other words, my help comes from the Lord. All the help that I want and all the help that I need is what he'll send me. And from him, I expect it in his own way and in his own time. If he doesn't help, then there's no one who can help me. But if he does help me, there's no one who can stop him. We must get our help from God and only him. And we do that by faith in his promises, his word. My help comes from the word of God and from prayer. My help comes from the Lord. The Lord was the Jews only hope at this time. And I'm sure that's what Mordecai was thinking here. And if Esther couldn't do it, God would do it some other way. He knew, Mordecai knew that deliverance would come. Why? Because he was familiar with the promises that God made to Abraham. So Mordecai, he challenges Esther. There wasn't a person on the whole earth who could have, you know, who who could have delivered her. So he said, Esther, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And I think Mordecai now senses the hand of God has been moving. And Esther is on the throne. She is the queen for a reason. Esther being in the palace, hey, that was no coincidence. And again, Mordecai says, who knows, Esther, if perhaps you were made queen for just a, for such a time as this. He didn't say that God had put her there. But that's pretty much what he's saying. If Esther would just stop for a minute, look over her past, look over her past life, look and see what God has done. It would be pretty hard for her not to believe that God wasn't involved and leading her all of the way. If God raised her to the throne, obviously God had a purpose for doing it. And that purpose was pretty now clear. Uh, God put her there to intercede for her people. Remember what Joseph said to his brothers, Genesis 50, 20, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. God often brings good out of evil. And then he moves forward with his plans, even by the sins of man. And that doesn't mean that God is the author of sin. You know, far be it that we would think that. And James even tells us, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But in God's infinite wisdom, he overrules those events. And then he directs all of them. And then he gets the glory. But if he wasn't involved, those events would be, would be dishonoring to him. Now, that doesn't make sin less sinful. It doesn't make sinners less punishable, but it reflects greatly on the glory of God and his infinite wisdom. So as you think about what Mordecai said, there are some basic truths about the providence of God that are important for Christians today. First of all, God has divine purposes to accomplish in this world. And God's purposes involve the Jewish nation as well as the Gentile nations of the world. They also involve the church. God deals with individuals as well as with nations. His purposes touch the lives of kings and queens and common people, godly people, wicked people. There's nothing in this world that God isn't in control of and that God isn't involved in. Mordecai made it clear that God uses people to accomplish his purposes. Now, why we don't totally understand what we don't totally, God allows people to do evil things in this world. We don't know why he does that. 
but he can work in and through unbelievers and in his own people to carry out his purposes. Even though God wasn't the person responsible for the king's sins, God used them. That is, God allowed the king's drunkenness and his foolishness in removing Queen Vashti. God used the king's loneliness to place Esther on the throne. And later on, we will see that he'll use the king's insomnia to reward uh, Mordecai and to, and to start to overthrow the power of Haman. In great things and in little things, God is always sovereign. He's always in control. So after the decree to kill the Jews was given, Mordecai and Esther could have given up. Think of it. They could have given up. They could have lost all hope. They could have decided, hey, you know what? Let, let's save only ourselves. Or let's just see, let's wait it out and just see what would happen. But instead, they saw that God had put them in their positions for a purpose. And so they took advantage of the moment and they did something. When we have the power to save others, we have to do it. In a life-threatening situation, don't back off, don't retreat. Don't behave selfishly. Don't wallow in, in despair. Don't wait for God to fix everything. Instead, ask God for his direction. Lord, what can I do? Show me. Lord, you know, help me to do something. God may have put you where you are at the moment for such a time as this. And even though God isn't mentioned in the book of Esther, it's clear that Mordecai expected God to deliver his people. And God's presence is seen everywhere in the book of Esther. Esther and Mordecai believed in God's care. And because they acted at the right time, God used them to save his people. So now we start to see God's hand moving right now in the affairs of the nation. And it's pretty clear that it was no coincidence for Esther that she won a beauty contest and that she became queen. She's there for a, de a very definite purpose. And God has been arranging this time all along. He had been working behind the scenes from the very beginning of the, of the book of Esther. He's prepared Esther for just this event. You see, God knew this event was coming. God prepared her for just this event. He knows, that, that it, he, he knows what's coming and, and, and that's why we can trust him. And in, in all things, God knows things, knows what's coming. He knows how, how he knows what's going to become of them. And we can trust him in all things. And when we put our hand in his hand, our God has the power to hold us. In Isaiah 41, 10, it says, for fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then in verse 13, he says, for I, the Lord, your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. Man, we have this comforting promise when God says, fear not, I will help you. It is God himself who has given us his word. What we are to do when we hear his word, we are to grab hold of his word. We are to grab hold of his promises and we're to hold on to them. And when we do, that's when our heart will find rest. And that's when our heart will be content to know that the one who loved us enough to give his son to die for us will never fail us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never leave those who commit their way to the Lord and trust in him. The Lord knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen next month. He knows what's going to happen next year. And you know what? He will take care of us. All we have to do is trust him. So Mordecai is becoming an honorable man. Mordecai is taking a stand for God. And Mordecai is willing to die for God as well as Esther. She is a queen in every sense of the word. Look at verses 15 through 17 now. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. 
My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against uh, the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So here we see Esther's greatness in the way that she answered Mordecai. She didn't have a lot of time to try to figure out what was going, to figure out things, and to think what she would do about the situation. She didn't have time to really think about what Mordecai said. But when when you think about it, what was there to think about? It was time to act. It was time to do the right thing. Knowing what to do usually isn't the problem. Because God's word tells us what we need to do. The problem is doing it. The problem is doing it. And the, the problem is, what's going to happen to me if I do it? What will it cost me? How will it affect me if I do it? You see, what are, what are, what are some of Esther's options? If she doesn't do it, well, she can say, well, you know, I could run for it. I could lie. I could tell him that, I, I could tell him that uh, I'm not a Jew. Or I could just say nothing and just let things happen as they will. And and A.W. Toza said, too many Christians want to enjoy the thrill of feeling right, but aren't willing to endure the inconvenience of being right. But Esther decided to make a difference no matter what happened to her. She said, if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. If I get my head cut off, so be it. She said, at least I'll die trying to do the right thing. David, when he went to take a care package to his brothers on the front lines, he gets there when he arrives and he finds this Goliath, this giant roaming around the battlefield. And he's insulting and he's blaspheming Israel's God. David said to the men around him, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? It bothered David. And when David saw that, 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 that what was going on and that nobody was doing anything about it, he basically says, hey, guys, let's do something. And then his, other, his, his older brother says, hold on there now, David, hold on. He says, you know, his brother says, David, this isn't one of your little sheep, you know, that, that knows your voice and, and follows you around everywhere. But David wants to know, why are you guys just sitting around doing nothing? He says, that guy out there, speaking of Goliath, that guy out there hates the living God. And he's dishonoring our God. What are you guys doing hiding in your tents? If you're not going to do anything, I'm going to do something about it. If I die, I die. And this is exactly what's going on in Esther's mind. She realizes there's an enemy out there, not just an enemy of her people, but an enemy of the living God. And when she realized that nothing was when she realized that, then nothing was more important to her. She was a queen. She could have had an easy life. But being queen and having an easy life, that wasn't important to her anymore. She felt it is time to stand up for what I believe. I am a Jew, and I believe in and serve the living God. And boy, that's the testimony we have to have today as Christians. I am a Christian, I believe in the Word of God, and I believe in the living God. And you know what? I am ready to take a stand all by myself if I have to. And I'm willing to die. If I die, I die. In the book of Acts, chapter 21, verses 10 through 14, we see that attitude in Paul. Agabus, it says, who had the gift of prophecy, told Paul, the Holy Spirit declares that you will be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to uh, not to go on to Jerusalem. But he said, why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And when it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. And and you know what? Really, that's what it's all about. The Lord's will be done. Paul silenced the elders and he tells them, look, you guys, I'm 
I'm, re- I'm ready not only to be bound, but you know what? I'm also ready to die if necessary, if that's what it comes to for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see courage and willingness to die for Jesus and a desire to proclaim the gospel and honor Jesus with some of the honorable reasons Paul used as arguments for going to Jerusalem in spite of the warning given to him by the elders. So in closing, we are coming to a time where the line is being drawn in the sand. And you have to pick a side. What side will you be on? For such a time as this, what stand will you take? Will you stand up for Jesus Christ? Will you stand up for holiness? Or will you take the side of the ways of the world and the ways of the flesh? It says in Exodus 32, 25 and 26, Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and he said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. Jesus said, You're either for me or against me. Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then in Joshua twenty four fifteen, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, again, we thank you for this wonderful little book, God, and we thank you for the uh, the words and the examples that are left for us here, God. And Father, may we take these things to heart, God. And may we take a stand for righteousness. May we stay, take a stand for Jesus Christ. May we take a stand for the word of God and may we stand upon it, Lord. May it, be, may it dwell richly in our hearts, Lord. May it find a home in our hearts, God. May it have a place in our lives, Lord, and may it be seen. God, may we not be just Christian by title or, or, or again, um, a profession, but by a reality, God, by the way we live. And Father, we look to you now. We thank you once again. May you bless this coming Easter weekend, God, and Good Friday. God, may you be glorified in everything that we say and everything that we do. And it's in Jesus' wonderful name that we pray. Amen.